very much, James. And welcome everyone to Curious Thinkers. Today we've got a really specially picked panel for you where we'll be talking about customer-led innovation or innovation that's informed by your customers and how this is going to unlock value in your businesses. Our panelists today have experience from a number of different ways, so we're hoping that to bring you a really different perspective with the discussion that we're about to have. Travis, um, who many of you have heard from before at Curious Thinkers, um, has experience in a startup, a digital bank, a fairly new business model in Australia. Samina uh, from Square has um, experience in a globally disruptive company who are providing experiences and services to many customers who have literally been unserved in the past. And Dai, who's from an institutional bank, so a really large incumbent organisation from both a local and global perspective. So we're hoping that all of these together will provide you with some really interesting um, learnings today. I wanted to kick off by talking about how customer experiences have changed and who, what customers now expect, particularly as platforms, large tech such as Google, Apple, Uber, Amazon have transformed the digital experience for customers. What does this mean for our organisations? In my view, expectations have been are now risen to a level that we probably mm. had never anticipated before and are continuing to do that at quite a rapid pace. So I might kick off with you, Di, if you can um, talk us about your experience in Hong Kong and in, Austra and in Australia about how you've seen customer expectations change over time. Yeah, well, welcome everyone today. Um, so look, I think firstly, customer expectations have changed dramatically. Um, and I think really what we've seen in the last 12 months, thanks to unfortunately the pandemic, is that people want things instantly. Um, and the ability to be able to get up and running with their business or change their product set, get it out to their customers, they no longer want to be waiting 12 or 18 months. So in, in the world I live in, one is on the institutional banking side where customers want to make that change and they want to make it immediate. And so therefore APIs, being able to provide the latest capabilities is really critical for us. And as we see more and more people coming in to try and disrupt us, our ability at Westpac to be able to really move with that change has been fundamental. Um, coming from Asia, I spent 12 years in Asia and I, I found that that economy or those economies were always pushing uh, the banks forward. Um, and then you saw the big tech giants, especially out of China, just change the game um, incredibly. In, in, in Australia right now, I think the digital transformation has been pushed with COVID and it's really, we don't have any more excuses. We're kind of like, oh, that's happening in Asia, that's happening there. Now we've got to act and I think you've seen so much happen in the last 12 months that we're going to see a lot more. Uh, so I think it's exciting, but it, you know, as a large incumbent bank as which we are, it's also pretty daunting yeah. to try and get our big machine to move quickly while you know people we've got on this panel seem to be able to move at lightning speed. Yeah. So flipping gear, Travis, not a huge bank, but certainly a hugely growing bank. Um, what do customers expect of banks in 2021? Uh, firstly, sorry I couldn't be in the uh, in the yeah. studio. Third COVID test, but uh, <laughs> negative again, which is good. We got this morning. Um, the the wonderful eastern suburbs. So look for, for us um, that we look at it in, in in a few different ways. So firstly, the, the the actual jobs to be done of banking haven't changed, but how you execute them has. And and, and Di mentioned a bunch of those before. Um, but but it's incredibly important that. You know, checking a balance, moving money, uh, and all the things that have always been there for banking that you think about how do you meet the needs of, of, of the customer that's really changed in the last five years, but in particular the last year. Um, so that jobs be done framework for us is critical around how we make sure we first understand what do the customers want to do, and then you look at how, how are we executing it based on those changing behavioural trends. Um, the second one is... <laughs> They actually want you to be a great bank first. So it's really easy to get to get uh, excited about the shiny stuff that sits on the fringe or maybe an add-on product. But if you don't, if you're not a great bank first, then you won't earn the right to do those other things as well and truly differentiate. 
So we've got a really huge focus on doing banking better than anyone else. But secondly, you know, providing you know, value beyond what you'd expect for a bank, but coming back to those jobs uh, that need to get done, need to be done. And then the third one is, you know, t- totally agree with Dyer that the the rise of you know the high expectation customer set, and and particularly for new oh, brands, you. that's yeah, you know, that's the starting point. So everything you know, we did some research last week uh, with twenty to twenty five year olds and twenty five to thirty five year olds, and the twenty to twenty five year olds were they 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 assess you first on everything they could possibly get from any other bank because they're so well informed. And then that's the base, and I'd like you to do something above. Um, and finally, you do need to be careful of the vocal minority minority in that earlier early adopter set, uh, because they may not be uh, representative of what mass market looks like, and um, and and who the actual jobs you need to get done and and to get product market fit. So that last thing is make sure you are getting multiple data points from multiple sources, because unfortunately, most of them contradict. And then over time, you're going to see those trends and patterns. Yeah, that's a really great point, Travis, making sure that you're hearing from the voice of your customers, not just a minority voice. Mm. I might turn to you now, Sam, and welcome from Victoria, Melbourne, um, where you've been in lockdown for a very long time, but you're still glowing and looking (laughs) happy. I guess you got to go out to kids sport on the weekend, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's absolutely right. They've let us out of jail slightly. (laughs) So, um, Sam, I'm keen to hear from your perspective, working at Square, what you see um, in this space from a customer expectation perspective from your US customers versus Australia or even some of the other countries that Square is um, currently doing business. Yeah, and thanks again for having me join from Victoria. Um, They're letting us out of our houses, but um, barely letting us into other states. So thanks for letting me join. Um, so yeah, customer servicing in, for us is critical to everything we do. And Bianca, you've worked with Square since we launched in Australia in 2016, and you know that the customer is at the heart of everything we do here. So our customer success team is our largest team in Australia, uh, but it's it's it customer servicing doesn't start or stop with them. Um, the way that we've launched our services and solutions make it extremely easy for our customers to self-service. And we try to really remove the friction from any touch point that they have with Square. So whether that's actually going and touching and feeling the hardware before they make an investment, so being able to go into a high street retailer like JB Hi-Fi and go and see our hardware um, before they purchase it and then be able to purchase it um, very easily, to being able to download an app and onboard onto our platform within five minutes, to them being able to troubleshoot. So they can obviously call into our customer success team to uh, in any of those parts of the journey, but they can also self-service with troubleshooting as well or onboarding. So we have our own YouTube channel and we have short videos to help them um, either with onboarding or troubleshooting. And we also have a seller community where sellers can talk to each other. So we call our customers sellers. They can talk to each other. They can troubleshoot. And we have a customer success advocate who's there to to support that seller community. So we make it really, really simple for businesses to um, operate and accept payments and manage their business. And we try and remove the friction as much as possible so they can get on with what they do best, which is running their business, which is either running a cafe or a large retail chain um, by making servicing and customer service suit their businesses, either by self-serving or getting on on a phone with one of our customer success team. Great, thanks, Sam. So I think the other thing that I've observed to have changed a lot, maybe over the last five to 10 years, is who we're being compared to as organisations. Mm-hmm. So it, it used to be historically that you would be compared to um, by consumers or your customers by like businesses. So if you're a bank, you're compared to other banks, retail, other retailers. But I think as there's been a blurring between payments, data, financial services, and just general experiences, mm-hmm. I think consumers have an expectation that's blurred. It's not You're not just necessarily being compared to like um, businesses. Um, so I'm keen to understand, um, Travis, I might start off with you um, first, what this means for banking. Uh, I, hear, I hear what you say that 
from a bank, consumers are expecting to do their general banking jobs and they haven't changed. But are there things that have changed with this blurred comparison? Oh, have we had our first mute moment mute, mute moment uh, during <coughs> the conference possibly <laughs> we had to have one <laughs> there we go <laughs> yes. look into yeah absolutely so i'll give you an example at the moment we've got a, a referral program which drives a significant amount of our customers every every week and we in order to look at how we're improving that obviously we've got um, feedback from our customers we do customer testing but we're also looking at what are the best actual referral and growth pipe programs glo globally that are agnostic of industry um, so, so you've, you've got to be willing to look at what what is what's best and then how do you actually take the elements of best that are relevant to your industry your customer set and behavior and, and look at how you can accelerate that um, the other part is you, you also need to be, uh, you, you have to move in incredibly quickly. And, and one of the ways that we go about building experiences and products is we get to market as fast as we can, because the longer you take to, um, sorry, I've got a seven week old and she's in the background. So apologies. If you <laughs> hear that. Um, so, so if, with a um, sorry, she's just distracted me as well. But so with that, with that customer set, uh, sorry, with that, with that expectation and product, with our shared accounts, we actually got our shared accounts to market through the call center, um, and this is a joint account. You think, well, why would a digital bank um, do that? We were able to get it live because we built it for mortgages, but we hadn't built the origination. That allowed us to then get a whole bunch of feedback from customers actually using our product to then launch the full service uh, six months later, but we'd already got all of those data points and feedbacks on how people actually use it in situ. So mm -hmm. you know, getting, you know, what MVP is now is really different to what MVP is. And then the, the, the last one for us is really making sure that you have a commitment to a particular experience. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really clear where you've got product market fit and then that you are, it's not a, and typically with a bank, you'll have, oh, this is our initiative this month. This is our initiative in a quarter. You actually have to have a continuous development of that experience and, and the outcome. Thanks, Travis. And, and we couldn't hear anything. I, I was waiting for someone to come in and pull your six, six month, was it out? But they didn't. <laughs> or is she so young, she's not walking yet. Um, <laughs> so Sam, what are the trends in um, digital innovation in payments that have taken you by surprise, particularly since you've joined Square? Yeah, uh, I mean, since I've joined Square, so just personal story, um, I have hardly met any of my fellow Squares because I joined Square during the beginning of the pandemic and um, here I am 18 months later. And so we've all been living through this pandemic and it's been, I think Di mentioned this earlier on, it's been incredible to see this transformation. I mean, we were seeing the cashless rise and we were seeing the growth in omni-channel customer experience rise, but that is just incredibly accelerated beyond any of our expectations during the pandemic. Um, for Square, you know, the majority of our sellers in Australia are very much bricks and mortar based. And, and what was incredible to see was actually the resilience and innovation from our sellers to continue operating during um, trading restrictions. And so we saw sellers, um, you know, well-known seller in Sydney called Mark and Vinny's. They're a restaurant, um, and they're a restaurant that were books week in advance and had walk-ins. Never had to consider having an online presence. Mm. And um, you know, when lockdowns came in in Sydney, um, they had to unfortunately let go of half of their staff. But within a day, they actually got set up online with Square Online, which is our um, online service, and were able to actually keep half of their staff and remain open, re remain trading by pivoting from a bricks and mortar business to actually an online business. And at Square, our products, product teams um, quickly pivoted as well from our plans for the year, um, which you know many organizations needed to do during COVID. And we were iterating on the solutions that we needed to um, offer to support our sellers during that period. So 
we um, within weeks we launched services in Australia like uh, contactless curbside pickup and um, self-managed delivery and then QR codes as well so that we could support our sellers during that period and um, it was just incredible to see the innovation from sellers to continue to operate um, and continue to be able to keep stuff on as well during that period. Yeah, it is mm. astonishing the urgency within which we've all been able to adapt mm. and change our businesses. Craig mentioned in, the, in our opening this morning that as an organisation we moved to remote working within days. Mm. I mean, it just wouldn't have been Amazing. possible if we would have set up a you know, usual project to do that. Um, diet working in such a large mm. organisation such as, as Westpac, can you talk us through how, how you've been able to approach this rapid change to sure. innovation um, and from a payments perspective? Yeah, so I mean at Westpac we've um, made some pretty bold moves in the last 12 months in relation to our strategy around innovation, which sort of comes from partnering. Uh, so over the years Westpac has made a number of uh, strategic investments, Zip being one of the most notable, um, trying to work out how we, we create a relationship with another entity and then use their platform. Um, the one that I think we've made the most progress with, or I know we've made the most progress with, is the bank as a service model, uh, which we have announced to the market that we Afterpay as our first customer, uh, followed by Society One. And the reason we've done that is distribution is changing uh, for banks and banks can continue to have their own brand and market. Uh, they can continue to try and innovate. But actually, if they look at some of the trends occurring, uh, financial services is now something that people don't necessarily look to their bank always to provide. So you can try and fight that trend or you can try and say, well, how can Westpac have a role in that? And the bank as a service is the way that we've tried to do that, where we see really um, innovative fintechs, major brands like Afterpay and a, a number of other brands that we're working with where customers want to have a deeper relationship with that brand. Um, it's buy now, pay later, but why couldn't I then have a transactional account with them? So we're essentially saying that we will continue to support the multi-brand strategy we have at Westpac, but we're going to enable, in some situations, our competitors um, or our disruptors uh, to be able to still play a role in our, in our clients' lives. Uh, because the way you distribute financial services is just completely changed. And if you look at a traditional bank today, running branches and running the platforms that you've got, the cost structure is just impossible to be able to complete, compete with the new, new disruptors. So if you can look at another way to access customers through other distribution partners, that could be the future for us. So we're sort of placing a couple of bets. That's one bet. And then the other bet is trying to innovate within payments now around the new payments platform, which has given us an opportunity to get some really interesting uh, solutions out to customers. But, you know, when I listen to Sam speak, we still have a lot of work to do and I am you know, feel that Westpac's moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so the, th the theme for our conference this year is unlocking value. Um, and we're really looking at giving our clients who are listening today some tips on how to unlock value um, in their business. And, and then obviously we're talking about customer-led innovation. So Travis, I'm keen to hear from you, having worked both in major banks and now in a smaller startup organisation that's no longer a startup, what you, ha what you would say are the opportunities and challenges for working in a smaller startup environment? Uh, the, well, the, the the beauty of smaller organisations is yeah, you can come up with the idea, work with the people, execute it, and, and grow it. So, you know, the, what comes that is uh, with that is a lot of personal accountability. But yeah, you, you can actually see it right through. And so, if I come back to um, at eighty six four hundred, we, we had our initial research that allowed us to understand what drives utility in banking and what drives delight through the, the Kano model was one of the techniques we used. And, and that helped us really hone in what are the things that we're going to be great at. And, and we classified them in sort of three main parts of banking being what's happened, what's happening, and then what's going to happen. And the, the what's happening, so the real time element and what's going to happen was an area that no one was doing that well. Um, and, and our first incarnation of that was actually 
connecting your accounts, showing all of your money back to you, and then predicting across all of your banks um, what uh, what bills are coming up. And that came back to a core job that very few you know, financial services institutions are doing well around the world, which was just help me stay out of trouble. You've got the information. Why don't you let me know? Mm. And <clears throat> what was really helpful around that was uh, myself and the CIO made a decision eight days after we launched. If we were truly going to execute well on what's going to happen with my money um, and the customer's money, we needed a better database. So we made that choice two and a half years ago now to rebuild our databases eight days after launch. That's then provided the technical capability for us to then build new experiences that haven't been seen before. So being able to, uh, being in small, you're able to set the strategy and the vision. You'd be able to really clear on what are the experiences that we're going to win on, but then make sure you're investing in the capabilities um, and, and being able to line up strategy and execution is, is really the beauty of small organisations. Um, and, and, it, and it really is data that is going to unlock experiences and then the underlying technology beneath it that, that, that will drive true to light and un unlock future value going forward in, in financial services. Absolutely. I mean, talking, just, just saying, oh, in, uh, eight days after launch, we decided to change our database. I think larger organisations, yeah. that just wouldn't <clears throat> be possible. I think that kind of speaks for itself, that you're able to p pivot and make a change as drastic as that. Mm. Um, Di, keen to hear from you. Working in a large organisation, how do you bring the customer voice into your mm. innovation and program of investment? Oh, look, I, I think it's, um, it's, you've got to be so conscious of the customer. Um, you know, in large organisations, you can get caught up with the process and forget about the outcome. Uh, so in the digital bank, the banks of service, we've partnered actively with customers from the very beginning uh, to get them involved in the whole process. So it's not like, oh, da da, here it is. It's let's co-create this together. So that's one example. Um, in the institutional bank, we've definitely tried to form um, advisory boards and key customers we go to to ask for advice. So we're thinking about this, what do you think? Um, not, it really re requires a huge amount of discipline. Um, and then in other parts of the bank, we do focus groups. But I think designing with the customer at the centre is easier said than done in a large institution. Um, and being able to cr you know, look at how your technology platform's designed to get the customer to the centre, not the product to the centre, is really challenging. And in the Bank as a Service offering, we've been really lucky that we started with a clean sheet of paper and a new technology platform that allowed us to start with the customer at the centre. I would though say that where you don't have that ability, and so I've got two jobs, that job that I've got new tech and this job where I've got old tech, I've really tried to use data to inform our decisions. So, what are our customers asking for? What are our client surveys telling us? And then look at how we can use data rather than gut feel yeah. to be the reason why we decide to do so. Oh, we all think it's a really good idea. Yeah, that's great. We're bankers talking to bankers. What's our customers telling us when they're using our platforms and what are our survey results telling us? But it is so important every day to wake up, I think, in a large organisation more than anything because you get so removed as what does the customer want? Yeah. Um, and I try to ask myself that every day. Yeah, it's good. Um, so Sam, I know that uh, Tra Travis mentioned how important data is um, when understanding what your customers are doing and what they might need. And I know that Square is a very data-driven organisation. Can you talk us about how um, Square approaches unlocking value from digital technology and data to meet the needs of customers or make experiences better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so data is absolutely at the centre of what we do as well as the customer. Um, and so even when we launched our first product, which was the Square White Reader, that was based on our founder having a really bad customer experience to be able to uh, accept a payment. And for him as an entrepreneur, um, having a business on the side, he wasn't able to do that. He didn't have what was required at the time, which was having lots of um, his financial history and, and credit history to be able to uh, accept a credit card payment. Mm -hmm. So 
that was kind of the our founding story was based on a cu customer experience and since then every product that we've launched um so since we've launched a square little white square reader that we're well known for we've launched more hardware as our businesses are growing and we're growing with them we've launched software um, based on customer feedback on based on their experience um, so we've launched hardware that is very specific to some of the verticals that we serve like retailers and restaurants we've we've launched specific hardware to serve, serve their needs based on their feedback and then most recently in Australia um, based on customer feedback you know we're not a bank but we've launched a loans product for small businesses because they were looking for a way to access credit in a much more easier way that that exists today which is you know having to go through credit checks having to provide financial history which a lot of small businesses and startups and entrepreneurs they don't have that so we the way that we've done that and to answer your question about data bianca um, and customer feedback is that we're actually using the data that we have on our sellers so you know we're accepting thousands of payments every day we're using the data that we have with them to make a decision, make a responsible credit decision to be able to offer a loan to an existing seller. And we can we can tell them what's available to them and tell them that they're eligible before they've even actually applied for a loan. Um, and based on that eligibility, they can then apply for a loan within three clicks and, and receive that money next business day. So we, we make it really easy by using the data that we have on them. Um, and we launch those products based on customer feedback as well. Great. Um, so I'm having all the fun here getting to ask you guys um, all of the questions, but from our audience, if you do have any questions, please um, start entering them through. And when I've finished um, with my questions, I will hand over, um, oh, sorry, I will ask your questions to our panelists today. So start entering any questions that you've had. Um, next, I wanna talk about Custom, customer led innovation and how to do it. We heard from James that over 90% of people believe that you need to innovate based on customer, um, the voice of your customer, but only 30% of organizations believe that they have a strategy that enables customer led mm. innovation. Um, and I guess it, it, you know, it sounds in, in that survey that there's a document or a, or, or a way or a how you do it, um, something that teaches you how to do customer-led innovation, but I'm keen to hear from each of you how your organisations approach that and, and what does it mean for your organisation? I might start off with you, Travis, if you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. I got the mute this time as well. <laughs> uh, there's a few different... So firstly, in the way that we actually uh, build our products, um, customer is, are involved, right? We use obviously the double diamond in customer centered design, which I think we call human centered design now, but mm. ultimately it's getting insights from customers. Uh, um, and we've tested our app and our, our overall experiences over 30 times. We've tested them consistently every really one to two months. Um, and we go back and test the same experiences as well. Part of that process as well, we actually involve the whole organisation. So our design team facilitates, but our um, we invite different people across the organisation to scribe in every session. So you get different frames of reference. Um, and that's been great in a couple of different senses. You don't just have one discipline interpreting what the customer says or does. You've got multiple, so you have a more chance of getting um, the takeouts right. But it actually gets more people engaged with your, with your product. Um, we, we also have complete transparency of feedback. So every bit of customer feedback, whether it's the call center, app stores, um, our NPS program, all is in real time fed into Slack channels. And every person in our organization has a view of that, including our chairman and our CEO. Um, and, and then the, the, the third one for us is uh, we actually run an AB um, environment. So at any given time, we have a staff app that runs in production and then we have a customer app. That has been phenomenal of driving engagement. And we actually have eight different teams, which every time we have a new feature, we deploy. And this is across the whole organization. And those teams test the new features, provide feedback, provide bugs and that sort of thing. And that drives really great engagement. But also it's a nice control around managing risk. 
And then the last one, and, and this is for everyone on the call, there are that many tools that are really secure, really low cost and really low, low, um, um, uh, low cost, great tools and, and low effort to implement. There's no reason why any senior person isn't interacting with customers on a daily basis. It, you can spend five minutes and they're the best insights you, you can possibly get. And I would challenge everyone that's uh, on this today, what tool are you using to talk to your customers on a daily basis, regardless of where you're in the organisation, because it's the best thing you can do, best five minutes of every day. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Travis. And I think, you know, when I spend time with the people at Cuskell's contact centre, I, I try and make, mm. um, make the time to do that, you know, a few times a year. And it's so insightful to hear directly from your customers. It really does put put it into perspective. Um, and so what about bringing people on the journey? Um, Sam, do you want to talk to us about um, the Square experience? And, and I mean, people are really at the centre of this at Square. How do um, your people get brought on the journey with this customer-led innovation approach? You know, as a global organisation, and, and I mentioned, you know, my own personal experience of onboarding at Square and pretty much 99% of my time has been working remotely. And I think something that we do really well, whether you know, you've been at Square for years or you're a new starter, is we talk about our founding story and we talk about you know, where Square came from. And it's, it's about uh, people understanding that struggle of our customers. Uh, so, from the very beginning, when you're onboarding, um, we talk about um, that founding story and, and Jim McKelvey, who's um, our co-founder with Jack Dorsey, the, the trouble that he had with accepting payments, which I mentioned, and where the idea of Square came about. Um, and then everything that we do is about making sure that that is at the heart of um, our decisions. So understanding our customer struggles and the mission that we're working towards, which is economic empowerment. Um, and I found it amazing even when I was interviewing and had, you know, my 50th interview and everybody was saying the same thing. Everybody was talking about economic empowerment. And I, I found that really fascinating. And it's true um, now working here because we, we talk about it often and we, as Travis was mentioning, um, listening to our customers as well is at the heart of what we do and, and um, a part of every decision that we make, no matter where you sit in the organization. So it makes it very easy to um, have that transpire borders globally, you know, and we're able to talk about that quite um, in cohesion, whether you're in headquarters in, in San Fran or you're working in one of our international markets. So I think we do that really well by making sure that it's part of the onboarding, but also a continuous part of what we do as we're doing our everyday work. Yeah, great, thanks. Mm. And I, from a larger organisation, it is harder because you've got mm. so many people, but how, do, how does Westpac approach bringing everyone on that customer-led journey culture? Mm. Like you said, waking up every day and, and remembering what's important. Yeah. Look, I think it's, I'm not going to say it's, it is incredibly hard in an organisation like Westpac to get everyone to wake up every day and think about the customer. Yeah. Um, it's incredibly hard for us to innovate too because we've got so much at stake. You know, if you think about the, the journey the major four banks have gone through and, you know, with our um, challenges with Austrac, innovation's really, it's almost frightening for some of our people. Like if I innovate, what about the control environment? What about our regulatory? You know, is this all is this all coming together? So, what we've done recently with the bank as a service was set up a separate team um, of about forty people, uh, thirty eight to be exact, to go and innovate without the without the challenges of the organisation. That didn't mean they were operating over here without making sure we were doing everything we needed to do to be compliant. It just enabled that team to be free from the constraints of where Westpac found itself. Um, as we're sort of coming out of the, um, you know, the remnants of the Royal Commission, moving through our remediation off the back of Austrac, um, you know, you can start to see now pockets of the company saying, okay, where, where are we going? And our CEO has been really clear on his three priorities, you know, fix, simplify and perform. And we can now see certain businesses moving into the perform, which 
to perform and grow requires innovation. Uh, but I would say we're on a journey, reminding everyone about the customer. Uh, something just really simple that we've started doing recently is the whole company gets five customer stories a week. So there's a nice little email that comes out and it talks about five customer stories. Now, those customer stories are not always good ones, but they're customer stories to remind us of are we doing the right thing? Should we continue doing that? And what do we need to do to change? And just that has just reinvigorated people to go, oh yeah, customer. Um, so look, I would say that in a large organization, you, you have so much at stake. How do you make sure that you don't risk that, but then the bigger risk of disruption is probably greater at the moment, yeah. which is sort of invigorating our people to say, right, what do we now need to do for the customer? But it's a long journey. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, dual transformation was a topic at our last Curious Thinkers event where we talked about uh, the strategy of setting up a smaller mm. business within your business to run free and see yes. how that works to really test all of the structured governance, people policies and see yeah. how that works. And I, and I think, you know, it is a successful model that we're seeing played out, not just in Australia, but internationally. Yeah, and it is really successful. You get, because then what happens is you get inundated from all these people who want to come there. Yeah, yeah. So then they're, well, we can't have all of you. So why don't you work out how you could do that within your small, um, within your division or your group. And there's nothing like success, right? Yeah. Success breeds many friends. Absolutely. Uh, so people now have a lot more confidence with what we've done in the bank as a service to go, wow, we can do things differently. Wow, we can innovate. And yeah. so I do think that letting one flower bloom, um, a large flower, yeah. <laughs> um, has given a lot of people in Westpac a lot of confidence that yeah. they can also do things. Yeah. And it's and it's up and running pretty quickly. Yeah, right? nine, nine so, months. Yeah, so amazing. You know, mo the most great things in the world, like humans, yeah. get born in nine months. So I reckon nine months is pretty good. Yeah, it's great. Um, so the last co topic I'm going to cover is it's not so much a topic, but we have promised all of our listeners today um, a few takeouts that they can take home with them. Um, around value unlocked and I'm keen for each of you to give me you know one or two gems that you want to um, share with our, our people who have joined Curious Thinkers today um, to take take back with them and that could be how you get your people involved in, in really thinking about um, customer-led innovation or what it is you do every day mm. or what you've seen I think it was a great idea the, the five customer yeah, um, stories each week um, as you say, Travis, it doesn't cost much to listen to your customer and you can find a way to do that. So um, it might be something that you've already said or you might have something that we haven't talked about. Um, I will start with Melbourne first. Um, Sam, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Um, it's probably summarising a couple of things that we've said already, but it's about, you know, keeping the customer at the heart of every decision you make and actually being really disciplined about that and systematic about that and measuring yourselves against that. So whether you are the CEO, whether you're an engineer, um, whether you're in accounting um, or you're, you know, frontline staff working with your customers day in, day out, you know, being systematic about listening to your customers and then understanding their struggle um, and, you know, that that probably gets more difficult, as Di mentioned, in larger organizations, but start somewhere, understand one of your customer segments, understand their struggle, and then be really systematic and disciplined about listening to your customers. Mm. That's my tidbit. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Di? Um, so, firstly, I, keeping customer at the centre, so waking up every day and thinking about the customer. Something my kids said to me a couple of months ago, which was really interesting, um, there's a movie on Netflix called Yesterday, and my kids said to me, how many times at work do you say yes? And so, I have challenged people now at Westpac to, there's no, there's no, um, there's no consequences of saying no, but there's massive consequences of saying yes. So why don't you just say yes? Say yes and work backwards. Yeah. Don't start off with, oh no, we can't. Yeah. Um, so I would call it have a yes day and see what change you can create in your company. Yeah, ice cream for breakfast, I'm assuming <laughs> at home on yeah. the day, the yes day. Yeah. Um, Travis, how about you? Yeah, I, 
And I, I will go back to real time, all your company can see feedback from your customer channels. Uh, we use Slack, um, in a, the email integration, the app store and uh, MPS integration is close to free. I'm sure it's the same in other organizations. Mm -hmm. And you can't be customer led, customer led without knowing what your customer thinks about your brand, your yeah. product, product, your are the good, the bad and ugly. And I can tell you now it's hard not to be customer led when um, your CEO and everyone else can see a problem in your organization. Uh, the other the, the other side of it is uh, we're now seeing uh, people see a problem, pick it up and go and fix it without even being asked because they're so engaged with what the customer's saying and they're taking ownership. So I, I would just, I can't emphasize enough the power of every role seeing what customers are saying about what you work on every day. Yeah. Thanks, Travis. Uh, so I do have some questions that have started coming in. Um, the first one is how can mutual banks develop a disruptive digital bank? One that's cost effective mm. for the innovative solutions. Um, I, I mean, I think Cuskell has done this and, and we did set up a very mm. different separate organisation that had its own board, its own licence, its own management team and its own premises. So um, we, we certainly did apply that approach that we weren't going to develop that from within. I'm keen to hear from your perspective, Travis, um, having done that, and you were working in a large organisation before that, what, what your recommendation would be? Uh, I'd just echo what you've said. Um, I, I, the approach that Cuskill took by acknowledging what Cuskill was great at, which is payments um, and, and, and bringing people in um, to, to actually start, but setting it up separately. I can say Cuskill was never involved in any day-to-day. -day. They were always there to help, but not the unhelpful help, which we know happens in, in larger organisations. Um, and then the other part would make sure you're getting talent right through your organisation because yeah. building or everyone here, bank, banking's hard. Um, and we've seen some, some recently try and fail and there'll be more like that, but it has to be separate. You've got to get capability and you have to have patient capital because it's not something that can happen in 12 months. Um, if, you, if you deliver something in 12 months, it's unlikely that it'll be disruptive. Yeah. Do you have anything, Di, that you'd add to that? Oh, I mean, I think the, the success you've had with 86400 speaks for itself. Um, I, I would say the same. You, you need to separate it from the core. I, I just think to... You know, you've got to make it someone's focus. You've got to put the right oversight in, but you've just got to let them run. And, they, you know, they're going to make mistakes. They're going to do some things really well. And if you, as soon as there's a problem, you know, in banks, it's like, oh, my God. You know, you've just got to let it go. And there, there really isn't a case study globally where a large organisation has been able to have a growth initiative within it all of the success that we've looked at and in, in coming up with what we did at Westpac just said, let, let it let it run, set it up separately. Yeah, yeah. Sam, I've got a question for you next. Um, we see a lot of startups charging quite a lot for transactions. Um, and I guess this is in the merchant um, acquiring seller space. Why do you feel that retailers are prepared to pay more for these kind of services? It's a really, really good question. Um, and, you know, we're a question that, you know, we, we have to answer on a daily basis because um, when you're comparing just price, things look very different, especially for a lot of the new players. Um, but it's not an apples for apples comparison when you're just comparing price with the um, traditional acquiring services that are out there to say Square's pricing model. So for any anyone who's not familiar, Square's pricing model is that you get a, a um, set fee per transaction. So it's a percentage fee um, and that is all. So there's no other pricing for hardware rental, which you might get, there's no fixed contract. So you're not locked in um, and there are no other hidden fees at all. So it's a real, you know, the benefit of that and where that works for some retailers is um, it's, sim it's a really simple pricing model to understand. Yeah. So that's why some retailers will be really prepared to pay that. 
And with that, you get a whole load of services with that. So, you know, we, we have, you know, data analytics services that all any seller can access once they're on board. So they can see, you know, where they're getting sales, what's selling well for retailers, for example. Um, so it's not just going into an office works and buying the hardware, um, accepting payments as a fixed fee is very simple to understand. So it, that then allows the retailer, if we're talking about retailers, to get on with their business and, and do what they need to do without having to actually understand uh, what, you know, how much does this cost me? I need to be PCI compliant. How do I manage chargebacks? What we do is manage payments and so we take that all on board and it's a really simple pricing model, which if you're just looking at the processing rate compared to a traditional model might seem expensive, but the reason why we've been so successful in Australia and, and you know, we've, we've seen so much growth is actually that simple business model that sellers are looking for. Yeah, great. Um, I think you've actually answered that ne the next question with yours. So I might turn to um, one of my other um, panelists. What can we learn about using data to start build, build to build more customer trust? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think for us at Westpac, you know, getting it right the first time is important and getting yeah. our data correct. So, uh, you know, there's nothing worse than a customer getting a letter where, you know, their name's spelled wrong or, you know, the amount that they were charged was incorrect. And we've learned a lot through um, the Royal Commission to, to get that right. So right now we're on a, a massive journey to improve our data across the enterprise. Um, it's, it, it has created a lot of governance and a lot of um, additional processes for people, but I think now people are seeing the value of the simple things in terms of getting data right. I think when you get data right, then you can use it. Yeah. Um, and that's where companies who don't have that legacy have been able to, to come in and disrupt our, our financial services offerings because they're starting from a nice clean sheet. When we get it right, then we can play it back to our merchants and to our institutional clients and to a retail client to say, well, did you know? And that's where I feel we're about to move in. That's where we're moving to rather quickly. On the institutional side, we launched a number of data uh, products over the last 12 months. You know, retail monitor, what's happening in your state, who's buying what. And that, that is really, and we don't charge for those services because they're just so important for yeah. our customers. So when you get data right, there's an opportunity just to make your customers happy. Yeah. And there's an opportunity then to commercialize it and also give something back to your customers to help them run their businesses better. Yeah. Now, Travis, I know you've already given us a few examples of this already, but um, keen for you to dig, dig in and, and find another one around building trust with your customers by using the data that you hold as a bank. Yeah, it, it's you need to come in with a frame that it's to the benefit of the customer. It's their data. How does their data yeah. help them do their banking or help them get more out of their money rather than traditionally in banking? Is it how do we use data to sell more stuff? Um, so I'll just give you a couple of really small examples. A simple one, we, for anyone that hasn't hit their bonus interest threshold for the month in their savings account, we send them a notification four days out, let them know how much money they need to put in. Um, we pay multiples more than the rest of the industry that it builds enormous trust that you're, you know, you're helping someone out rather than catching them out. And then to Di's point, there's some of the smaller things um, when a refund comes into someone's account, we actually then send a notification to them, letting them know that the refunds come back. So it's where you've got the data and it can be helpful for the customer in terms of getting them something done or taking you know, that stress away, um, that builds trust over time. The best way to destroy this trust is to use that data to push products onto people that they don't need. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got one more question and it's a really interesting one. So I'm keen, um, so jump in if you've got an answer to this, but we've talked a lot about bringing your people on mm. the journey um, with customer led innovation. The question is, how do you bring your board on the journey um, with customer led innovation? So um, I might kick off with you again, Travis, while, you're, while you've got your mute off. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, it's a bringing boards along. You've got to be careful how much information you do and don't give because it can generate the wrong questions. Um, look, again, it's being open and transparent. So uh, we, we, we actually, for instance, our chairman can see all of our performance and sales in real time. 
So yeah, you're having conversations around what to do next uh, and and how to improve the business rather than how do I find the data to understand the business. So it's getting that right information to your board early outside of your traditional you know, monthly or quarterly cycles. Uh, that that would be you know, one really functional way that we've used and, and you have far more uh, efficient conversations with your board. Hmm. Yeah, great. Thanks, Travis. How about you, Sam? Any any um, tips on that? Um, I, I might flip it a little bit for Square because, um, you know, we, given our founding story being so customer led and what we do, I, I don't think that's a challenge that we have at Square in terms of bringing our board along the journey. Um, but what we have done very intentionally is make sure that we have a very diverse board in place that we can learn from and that can challenge us in that diverse thinking um, at Square. So we, we have an, a board in Australia, I sit on that board, but for Square Inc, um, our board that sits across our different businesses, Square Cash, which is our consumer business in the US and then Tidal, which we recently acquired, um, which is in the music industry. We have for Square Inc, we have a board that is very diverse so that we make sure that we bring in those diverse perspectives that really challenge us. Um, and it comes back to that heart of our mission across all of those businesses, which is economic empowerment. Um, so I think, yeah, just my answer is more making sure that you have a really diverse board in place that is going to help you challenge yeah, your thinking. That's great. Thanks, Sam. Mm. And Di, as we close, what, what would your mm. tips be on that? Well, actually, I think our board is probably our big, biggest advocate of yeah. innovation and change at Westpac. Yeah. So we're really fortunate to have that. I mean, I do think, though, you know, boards need to change to have a more diverse set of people on them who have had a variety of experiences. So hard to influence who sits on your board, but my view would be you need to get some people who've not been at banks or have dealt in very different industries to bring that fresh thinking um, and challenge executives on what needs to be done. So it's a challenge, but at Westpac, I know the board is actively pushing us for more yeah. innovation. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you everyone, Di, Sam, Travis. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today. And um, thank you for being so Pleasure. open and transparent with um, sharing your thoughts and learnings on this topic. Uh, over to you, James.